All right, let's uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we will get into our passage for today in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 19 and finish up that chapter. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we can spend a few minutes in your word. Thank you for the word that has been read for us. Thank you for the scripture we're about to look at. I pray that you would use uh, the next uh, few minutes, the next little while to speak to us, to encourage us, and through the power of your spirit, uh, to help us to be conformed to the image of your Son. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, over this past week, as I've been studying and reading and preparing for today's message, I was reading another book at the same time as this one, uh, A Flame on the Front Line, as the name was by, uh, I was going to say a young man named John Weaver, but John is the same age as me. And so he is not young anymore. Um, I met John when we were in Bible college together. And um, he was a student there at the same time. He was a relatively new believer at the time. He was incredibly passionate for the things of God. And, um, and I will tell you, I, I saw him again just a few weeks ago at our Free Will Baptist National Convention. He brought the message during the Wednesday night worship service, this missions-oriented service. He brought the message and um, I would say his passion for the things of God has not dimmed in the least all these years later. Uh, and that was encouraging to me. John uh, went on uh, after Bible college. He went to Columbia International University. Uh, well, he went to UT Arlington for a little while in Columbia International University. Studied cross-cultural missions, a variety of things related to that, and um, and served short-term in a host of places, but then settled and served with a, as an aid worker with a, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, in the, in the place that had captured his heart for years and years, and that was Afghanistan. And, and I do not understand why God has not given me a burden for Afghanistan, personally. Like, I see the need, and, and I don't know if you watched the news today, like literally today, they are airlifting people out of Afghanistan. Like, it's, it's reminiscent of uh, the end of the Vietnam War in Saigon, that, those airlifts. It's eerily reminiscent of that in some ways, but John has a passion for Afghanistan. He lived and worked there. He met his wife there. She was also uh, working in Afghanistan as an American working over there uh, doing relief work and evangelism work and some other things. They met and fell in love and were married. They had a Christian wedding in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't know if you know this. He says in his book, I was not aware of this, that there's not a single Christian church, like a church building in the entire nation of Afghanistan. Not, not one. There was for a little while in the 70s, but it was uh, demolished. It was torn down. It was attacked, and it was only in the, the building was only in existence for six or seven years. I think not very long at all. There are a number of Christians in Afghanistan, and in fact, if you go back historically, before the before the Muslim world existed, that was a very it was a very Christian place. That that entire part of the world was very Christian, largely because of the work of. Paul in the first century that we've been reading about. So, so John in this book, he shares his testimony and how God led him to serve in Afghanistan. He gives a real life description of what it's like to serve in this largely unreached, unchurched country. And, and it all happens in a Muslim context, a place that is actively antagonistic, actively out to get people who believe in the Messiah, people who have placed their faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and, and, and out to get those who uh, believe and proclaim the truth of the Scriptures, the truth of Jesus is. By the way, I would recommend this book. If you want to borrow it, I will loan it to you um, very cautiously, and I'll probably remind you several times, don't forget you've got my book. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to do that. You can order it on, on Amazon. Uh, in fact, if you want to borrow this copy, you're welcome to do so. It already has my name in it, so, you know, just be aware of that. 
if you keep it too long, that's stealing, and that's a whole other thing. But, but I'm glad to loan you my book. Glad to. Can't you tell? Um, this idea of this place and people that are so out to get people who preach the truth or believe the truth, people who proclaim the truth, the, the truth about who Jesus is. It's an interesting thing to me. I, I don't give it a lot of thought, frankly, because of where and when we live. This is not something that I have to worry about or that you have to worry about. There are people who will sometimes say some snarky things and they might be rude to you, but nobody is really, there's not a large uh, presence that's out to get you for being a Christian in the United States, especially in a place like Texas. Like, it's just a reality. You know? So, you might feel a little oppressed, or you might feel a little picked on, or you might feel a little singled out, but you can't tell me you really feel persecuted. Like, it's just not a real thing here. And so, it's easy for us to forget that there are places in the world where that is happening actively right now. But not just that, but that's how the church started, is in those places where it was very much that minority, it was very much singled out, it was very much truly, truly persecuted. Um, so Bible college and seminary conversations are interesting. I'm not talking about classroom conversations, those are too. But I'm talking about the ones where a group of uh, Frankly, it's in seminaries, it's mostly men, but, but a group of people sit around and speculate about things. They talk about things, and they're the things of God. They're, they're, they're not unimportant things. These are more like casual conversations, but they're about deep and important theological matters. Actually, a great many of them are not about deep and important theological matters at all. Um, I, I, I remember... Um, well, a lot of these things people sit around and talk about that I really enjoy, they're things the Bible doesn't talk about much at all. I've said this before, if I ever had the opportunity to teach at a seminary or a Bible college, I would want to teach a course on speculative theology, right? Things that don't really matter that we can just kind of speculate on. And as long as your logic is consistent, there aren't really any wrong answers. Like It'd be like, it'd be like a course in, you know, comic book superheroes or something. It doesn't really matter as long as the, it's consistent within its own universe. It's, it's fun. It's interesting. That's, that would be fun for me. Um, but I, I feel like when I was in, in Bible college, there was some guys sitting around having a conversation uh, and one of them asked something along the lines of if, if you could choose any period in time to be to live in, to be sort of transported to to live in, when would that be? And you know, there's, I feel like there was one guy who was kind of a, an American history nerd, and so he thought, you know, the founding era of our country, the revolutionary era, that would be interesting, it'd be dangerous, and it would be exciting, but it would be really interesting. And there were several people had ideas about these things, and one one guy said he wanted to live, he would want, to, he would choose to live in the first century church, like in the, the founding days of the, of the early church. And, um, and it wasn't his answer that I found striking, although it is a little bit. It was the one who was asking the question, he asked a really good follow-up question. This is, these are guys who are preparing to go into ministry. He said, yep, yeah, but would you still be a preacher if you lived in that time. The thing you do now, the thing you're trying to do now, would you still, is that who you would be there? There, And that's a hard question to answer. Not just because you don't know what you don't know, but it's a hard question to answer because, like, if the question, if the question instead of it being, would you be a preacher, is it, would you want to still be a preacher? Well, yeah, you hope you would still be. Well, sure, absolutely. This is what I'm called to do. This is who I am. But that wasn't the question. The question is, would you? I, I think I've been the type of person, I, I think I'm the kind of person now who is willing to suffer for the Lord if necessary. But 
You know, it's hard to know because I have not had to. I've truly never been faced with genuine suffering for the Lord. But if, if we were doing this, then there is a the very real likelihood that those of us who remain faithful to the things of Christ, who follow Jesus, who really do live our lives as His disciples, there is not just a possibility but a likelihood that we would have genu uh, genuine suffering, genuine pain and persecution. The fact of the matter is, is that the first century church faced unbelievable persecution and trial. Like these are things that are just hard for us to even fathom sitting here in 2021 in Central Texas where we can do just about whatever we want to do, more or less. They didn't have that kind of freedom. The, the type of people who walked with Jesus during that time had to be truly sold out, fully committed to Jesus and who He is and to the Gospel and to the Great Commission in ways that are hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to grasp what real persecution looks like, but it's hard for us to grasp the real commitment that it, that it takes to live through that, to follow Jesus through that persecution. Do we have what it takes? Do we have the determination? Do we have the courage? Do we have the perseverance? Do we have what it takes to stand then? If, if I were to be plucked out of here and dropped there, would I make it? And the answer is, I, I don't know. I doubt it, to be quite honest, to be quite frank. I don't know if I have... I don't know if I'm made of the right stuff. The gospel at that time, it was often met with not just anger and outrage, but genuine violence. Consider what it meant to follow Jesus. Consider what happened in Ephesus when Paul stayed. He stayed about three years, the longest he ever stayed anywhere, as far as we can tell, in, in any of his missionary journeys. He stayed and he preached and he planted churches and he discipled people. What happened? The place rioted. It caused an uproar in the entire city. And Ephesus was a pretty good sized city. They say about 300,000 people. The evangelistic work, the discipling work, the church planting work of one man grew to the point that it caused riots in the streets. Acts 19 in our passage today, Acts 19, beginning verse 21 through verse 41, it's the rest of the chapter, it tells us about a riot that broke out in Ephesus as a result of the church and especially as a result of Paul and their efforts at spreading the gospel in that town and around the world. So let's take a look at this passage. We're going to go through it a little section at a time. But the, the thing I want us to think about as we read this, as we discuss this, is the fact that the church, and I don't just mean the church generically, globally, but a church, dare I say our church, this church actually through the power of the Holy Spirit has the power to be a transforming influence over entire communities. And I know that's unbelievable as we sit here in this group today and you look around and you say, yeah, do, do, do we? I'm telling you that I believe we do, not on our own, but through the power and the strength and the working of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think that's the most glaring truth in this whole passage is that the church has the power to transform communities. And so we're going to work through this text and, and make some comments as we go. Let's start reading uh, verse 21 of Acts um, 19. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I had been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. And we heard in the scripture reading today, in that first chapter of the letter to Rome, the church in Rome, he said, I've been wanting to come there. I've been wanting to come see you guys. I'm still trying to get there. And this is one example of that. And Paul has got it in his heart and mind. I need to get to Rome. 
And so this was not a new thing for him. Uh, he sent uh, two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius who made silver shrines of Artemis brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. Now I want to leave this up here for just a minute because we'll talk about Demetrius in just a moment. Demetrius, this gives us enough detail about him to, to make some observations. And I think this you have to know that you have to kind of get a uh, set the stage for the context that all this is happening. So, so Demetrius is a silversmith. Um, he, uh, in fact, in fairly recent years, there's been an inscription found in the old city of Ephesus, uh, of, and it it refers to a Demetrius. We don't know if it's the same Demetrius, but it dates to about about the same time. It refers to a Demetrius as a temple warden of Artemis. Now Artemis was a goddess, a, a false god. And, and she was a god of fertility um, and that was in terms of having children, in terms of fertile crops, in terms of uh, um, lots of success in hunting. I mean it was in any way that you could achieve growth and success and advancement, Artemis was the one for you. And um, and so Demetrius was a silversmith who did uh, work to help in the worship of uh, Artemis. Now, in in Roman uh, uh, mythology, in Roman the Roman godhead later you're gonna you would hear about Di uh, Diana. This is the same goddess. So. In addition to being a silversmith, he also, it looks like, he provided silver to the other craftsmen. So he's making money, making stuff and selling stuff, but he's also selling materials so other people can make stuff and sell stuff. And then the third thing is that he and these craftsmen, they used the silver, they shaped object of, objects of devotion for the goddess Artemis. Now most of these would be like small small items, like, like miniature statues of Artemis or miniature replicas of the temple of Artemis. Now the temple, this was, it, it was an incredible, this is an artist uh, representation of it, but um, we, we always hear about the Parthenon in Athens, right? And what, what a marvelous wonder it was. The temple to Artemis was about four times the size the footprint was, about four times the size of the Parthenon. It was gargantuan. Um, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It, it was supported by 127 pillars, and each of those pillars was 60 feet tall. This thing was huge, and there was intricate carvings above. There were statues around. I mean, it was, it was quite an incredible place. And the worship of Artemis, or Diana, uh, it dominated Ephesus during this time. She was this goddess of fertility, like I said. There was an inscription found in Ephesus, it refers to her as the greatest god. So what was happening is there was this entire sort of guild of merchants. And they're profiting off this devotion to Artemis. And so we kind of know a little more about what's going on in the community. And we can understand the source of the trouble that Paul gets himself into. So let's continue on. This is verse 25. Um, he called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There's a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now notice the order that he makes his complaints. Now his complaints are all about the worship of, and the diminished worship of Artemis, but first he complains that this is our livelihood. Like we're selling less silver stuff and making less money. He is going to crush us economically. 
Oh, and by the way, he's also going to diminish the value of the goddess Artemis. See, it's very telling about what's really important to Demetrius. Um, so it's really a commercial problem. This isn't the first time that Christianity is coming to conflict with the business world. It wouldn't be the last time. More and more people come to trust in Jesus. There's going to be less and less demand for the things needed for idol worship. And so they're angry. Their, their primary objection was economic, but they were able to stir up a mob and dress it up in spiritual language. Now, I would love to say that worshipers of idols and false gods are the only ones who do this. But they are not. We do it. We, 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 do, we look for the things that we think are important to us as Christians, as the church. They're important because they make our lives easier and more comfortable. And we wrap them up in spiritual language and go to war, forgetting that we are part of a different kingdom. I, I will, I'll not get into the details. I'll let your imagination, or if we want to, you want to have a conversation, I'll be glad to do that. It's a time and place thing, but just know that that's not a market that's been cornered by people who don't trust in Jesus. We do this too. And so, um, so this mob, they, they get themselves worked up into a frenzy. They, the crowd grows. They seize two Christians and they drag them into the theater in Ephesus. Now, let's continue on. Um, uh, the the crowd. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now remember, this is the crowd who's been whipped up by Demetrius and the other silversmiths. They want the money, but in order to make that happen, they got to get the crowd wired up about the religion. Uh, soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. So here's the theater. Like I said, uh, Ephesus was not a small town. It was a large city. This was a theater. This is, again, this is a representation of it, a virtual reconstruction of it, but it would see 25,000 people. It's a big place. They would come for lectures and to hear rhetoric, and they would come for uh, dramatic presentations, and they would come for all kinds of things. This was the, the sort of the gathering place for the city. And so, so the, the, this mob, as this mob builds, this is where they land. land. This because you can, they can be spoken to and can be heard, and and so this is where this is happening. It reminds me a little bit. Uh, there's a story. Uh, with Paul, Paul reminds me because he's he's by himself. He's a one man operation at this point. Gaius and Aristarchus have been seized and have been taken to this place, and the crowd is after them. And Paul, one man, wants to go to the theater. He th I guess he thinks he can rescue them on his own. It, it reminds me. There's the old story about uh, uh, a, te a Texas town, small Texas town, years and years ago, uh, a riot had broken out. Uh, the Texas Rangers sent a ranger, and when the leaders of the city met the ranger, he came into town, they said, there's only one ranger? And he said, there's only one riot, isn't there? Like, that's the, the Texas Rangers motto. One riot, one ranger. That keeps moving around. Put it back on the flag. Hey, there we go. One riot, one ranger. So, this is kind of Paul's attitude, right? There's one riot. I can go in and take care of this. I'm going to take care of Garrett Gaius and Aristarchus. And Paul's desire, and I appreciate this, but, but it's misguided. Paul's desire to go into this dangerous scene and to, and to rescue his friends who are facing what looks like almost certain death. And Paul saw it primarily, I think, as an evangelist. Paul saw it as an opportunity 
Look, at there's 25,000 people gathered here, and I can preach to all of them at one time. I think that's probably what Paul was thinking. But Paul's friends and some other city leaders that had gotten to know him said, you can't do that. Let's continue on. Verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. You ever been to one of those meetings? The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours they chanted this. Now, this is an interesting development in this thing. So they're, they're rioting, there's confusion, some people don't even know why they're there. And finally, a Jewish man named Alexander makes his way to the front. Now, was he shoved to the front? Did he jockey his way to the front? I don't know, but his job... It, there's no indication that he was a Jewish man who believed in Jesus. There was, a, there was a, uh, a historic Jewish presence in Ephesus. We know this because there was a well-established synagogue in Ephesus. And Alexander, however he got to the front, his job was to distinguish between the Jews who are loyal Roman citizens and who are loyal to the emperor and who are right, whatever, the Jews in the synagogue are not the same as the Christians who have stirred up this riot, even though the Christians didn't actually stir up the riot. So the whole point, Alexander's job, was to help the, uh, the people of Ephesus see the difference between the Jews and the Christians. Because at this point, Christians were largely seen as a sect of Judaism, a subset of Judaism. And so his job is to, no, no, no don't lump us in with them. But he didn't even get a chance he was shouted down with this chant of great as Artemis of the Ephesians. They had worked themselves into this frenzy. It was almost like a like a group hypnosis. They, they know what was going on. They didn't care what was going on. Great as Artemis of the Ephesians. But then finally the crowd is dispersed by what I think is kind of an unlikely source. Um, says that the city clerk, who could be roughly equated to a mayor or a city manager, this is the guy who runs the day-to-day -day operations of the city. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You've brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open, there are proconsuls, they can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So God has chosen to use a non-Christian government official, we saw this a few weeks ago, a non-Christian government official to protect his church, to protect these believers. And you know, God does this. He uses some of the most unlikely sources sometimes. People that will turn out to be your friend that you didn't know could be your friend. And, and, and I think this is a sort of fascinating episode in the life of the early church. And, and it's all built on this principle that the church has the power to transform whole communities. This city of Ephesus was a different place because Paul and the church had established there. We have to reclaim this truth in our lives, in our church today. We have been given the Holy Spirit. God is with us. God is for us. Christ has risen from the dead. This is the message that we have. We have, through the, through the Spirit, we have the power to change whole communities. We have the power to make a difference. And we don't act like we do. Do we, do we really believe it? 
do we believe that we could do work through the Spirit, that we could do work that would reduce the crime rate in this part of the city of Bryan? Do we believe that that's possible? Do we believe that it's possible that families could be healthier because we have the opportunity to interact with them? Like these things are probably, we can change communities. The early church seemed to understand uh, this. Everywhere they went, darkness was turned into light. They had a vision for the kingdom. But not only can the church, an individual Christian has the power to transform communities. Now think back to Demetrius' complaint. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, you know, my friends, we have a good income from this business. And you see in here how this fellow Paul, now it's the whole church at work, but boy, he lays it all at the feet of Paul, doesn't he? And I won't read the rest of it. This, uh, this, this complaint about, um, about Paul diminishing the value of their work. The church, yes, absolutely, but Paul specifically had been a champion of the gospel. He had been preaching in a powerful way, had been making disciples, he had been multiplying his influence across other people. And, and he points out, Demetrius does, points out one specific phrase that I think is very telling, it's very important. Paul was saying that gods made with human hands are not actually gods. Now, to you and me, that sounds pretty intuitive. If I carve out an idol, right, I don't think there's anybody in this room who would say, like, yeah, it's John, it's wood, or it's metal, or it's whatever it is, right? Like, that's not a real God. It's not a real God. I think we live in a place and a time where that's we understand that. But this was this was groundbreaking for these people. God's made with human hands are not God's. But we still worship all kinds of things that are made with human hands. Not just things that are crafted from silver. Although there are plenty of people who their jewelry is important to them. Like, I mean, I, we worship these things. I, this is important. Jews and Christians both hated idolatry. They both knew that idolatry was one of the ultimate evils in terms of sin against God. And yet, with a strong historic Jewish presence here, this was still the center of the world when it comes to the worship of Artemis, the greatest goddess of the time. How is that possible? How is it possible that, that you had this long-established Jewish population and they had done nothing to combat the worship of a false god? It's because they didn't challenge the culture. They held on to their convictions within the walls of the church. They didn't take the mission out. Paul was a missionary. He was an evangelist and he was a disciple-maker. He did not leave that message inside the walls of the church. He, I don't. There's no evidence that he was ugly to Demetrius. There's no evidence that he picketed outside the silversmith places. There's no evidence that, like, there's no evidence of any of that. What there is evidence of is Paul formed relationships with individuals and discipled them in the way of the Lord. He helped them to understand the Word of God, how to pray, how to how to read the Scriptures, how to study it, how to follow Jesus. And when you do that. You don't have to spend a lot of time beating up silversmiths. We boycotts have been a, had a long history in America. Like America's first boycott, arguably, was the Boston Tea Party. Like I mean, we we're not going to use their tea. We're going to destroy it, and we're going to like. But but the church has tried to adopt this method of boycott, and we get so enraptured. Now I'm not saying like if it's wrong, it's wrong. Like don't. Don't spend your money on wrong, right? But, but we get so caught up in social change through economic progress and, and politics and, and all of these things that we forget 
that if we would just make disciples out of people, they would quit buying idols from the silversmiths. We don't have to pick at everything that's wrong. We need to disciple people into what is right. I, I, one person can make a difference. Now, I, I want to close with this story. It's a guy named John Getty. John Getty was a Canadian missionary. He uh, went to the New Hebrides Islands, that's what's now known as Vanuatu. This was in the mid-1800s. When he got there, when he got there, he was faced with uh, a, a tribal people that were considered to be one of the most dangerous groups of people in the world at that time. They were cannibalistic, they were violent, they were murderers, they were thieves. In 1849, early in his work there, he wrote these words in his journal. In the darkness, degradation, pollution, and misery that surrounds me, I look forward in faith to the time when some of these poor islanders will unite in the triumph song of ransomed souls. And he believed that he could make a difference. He believed that God could use him, that the power of the Spirit in him could make an impact on these people. He didn't degrade them. He didn't refer to them as savages. He didn't refer to them in derogatory terms. They were islanders. They lived on an island. But he was honest about their situation. And he had faith that the time would come when they would come to follow Jesus. That some of them would be disciples. 1872, just before Christmas, John Getty died. He had spent all these years on this island. A plaque was placed behind the pulpit in the church, in the village, on the island where he preached. This is what was inscribed on that plaque. In memory of John Getty, D.D., born in Scotland, 1815, minister in Prince Edward Island, seven years, missionary sent from Nova Scotia to An uh, Anatium for 24 years. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. He went with the message of the gospel, the power of the Spirit, and the hope of the future. And his goal was that Hopefully, in a few years, I believe that there will be some who will follow Jesus. And in the, by the time he died, it was a Christianized culture. One man made an eternal difference because he believed that it would happen. He believed God would use him. When he landed, there were no Christians here. When he left, there were no heathen here. One person, one church, used by God to transform a community. Paul, there are, we could list hundreds of people this is true of, missionaries and pioneers and even good godly disciples who've worked in politics. I mean, there's all kinds of people we could mention. I thought this was a beautiful example. One person determined to give it all for Jesus Christ. We saw that in the life of Paul. We illustrated with John Getty. Could that be us? Could that be you and me? Who God uses to transform a community because we trust that He will do that through us. Will you bow your heads with me for prayer? We're going to pray. We're going to close the message. We're going to sing a couple of songs a couple of short little choruses. As we sing, I want to give you the opportunity to respond if God has put something on your heart. It could be something about this, how you feel like God wants to use you or wants to use you among us or in our community. It could be something else God's placed on your heart that you want to pray about or talk about. I'd love to pray with you. I'll be out in the foyer and we'd love to visit God has called us to be committed to Him.
and he's empowered us to make a difference in the lives of those around us. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you that you love us, that you call us to yourself, and that you use us. And that, Lord, that if we let you through the power of your Spirit, that you, you don't just use us, you use us in mighty ways, powerful ways, to make a difference in the lives of others. Help us to be those people. Help us to be that church that loves you, loves our community. And our community begins to sense your love for them through our love for them. Help us to make a difference in the lives of those around us. We ask it all in Jesus' name.